The Subcommittee on Energy will now come to order. The chair now recognizes himself for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. I want to thank you all for joining us this morning for this important hearing entitled Milling a 100% Clean Energy Economy, Solutions for the U.S. Milling Sector. This hearing is part of a series that we will be holding in this subcommittee and in other subcommittees to highlight areas where we can achieve significant emissions reductions in order to achieve a 100% clean energy economy by 2050. As Chairman Malone, Chairman Tonker, and I proposed back in July. As we know, the building sector is responsible for an estimated 40% of energy consumed and greenhouse gas emissions that are produced nationwide. At the same time, there are enormous opportunities for reducing these emissions through technology advances, efficiency standards, and innovative programs such as Energy Star, Smart Metering, and others uh, that are on the drawing boards. Additionally, there are tremendous employment opportunities for putting Americans uh, to work in my district and in every district in our nation. These are good paying, quality, retrofitting jobs that cannot be exported. In fact, earlier this week, e, e for the Future released its 2019 Energy Efficiency Jobs in America report which showed that the energy efficiency sector added more jobs than any other energy sector for the second straight year. The study noted that there are over 2.3 million Americans currently employed in the energy efficiency sector, including more than 89,000 jobs in the state of Illinois, and over 5,000 jobs uh, in my district on the south side of Chicago. While it is important for Congress to provide resources and establish policies to guide access in these areas of energy efficiency, uh, as my bill, H.R. 1315, the blue and green color job bill does, it is also critical then the federal government sets the example through its action. You can't lead where you don't go. There are literally thousands of federally owned office buildings, courthouses, post offices, and the likes that must be retrofitted in order to save millions, if not billions of dollars annually in energy savings. My staff is working on legislation that would ensure that the Federal Energy, Energy Management Program, or FEMP, must ensure that minority business owners and entrepreneurs are able to participate in this multi-million dollar tax-funded program. Indeed, it is way past the time for the Department of Energy to open up these contract, contracts so that the Good Old Boys Networks are not the only entities re receiving these lucrative government bank contracts. Tackling this issue of making our homes, our schools, and our business, businesses more energy efficient will save money, put people back to work, and expand the American middle class. It would help us to address the severe issue of climate change also. So I welcome each of these distinguished panelists uh, to, today, to today's hearing. 
and I look forward to engaging them on the best ways to achieve each of these objectives. It is now my distinct honor, privilege, uh, to welcome my friend and my colleague from the great Midwestern state of Michigan, the ranking member, Fred Upton, for his opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we are close friends for sure. Uh, but I also want to thank our witnesses for appearing before us today. But before we begin, I just want to call our attention to a legislative matter that does require the full committee's attention. As you know, the Pipeline Safety Act is about to expire in a, another week and a half. And we should remind everyone that this is a reauthorization bill that we have consistently passed with unanimous consent under Republican majorities. I am troubled that we're not yet at a point where we can say that we have a bipartisan agreement uh, to move forward to full committee. Uh, we owe it to our constituents to do better. So I would hope that we can work together uh, on this bill in the, in the short couple days ahead. Uh, turning to the subject at hand, I want to use today's hearing to focus on real world <laughs> solutions to improve the performance and environmental sustainability of our homes and our commercial buildings. Thanks to innovation and technological advancements, we are making great strides to reduce energy consumption and enhance building performance, but we still have room for improvement. So as we consider clean energy solutions for the building sector at the federal level, we have to recognize that these high performance or green technologies are often more expensive to design, build, and maintain. And as policymakers, we need to take this into account, especially as we are confronted with declining rates of home ownership increasing rental prices and high vacancy rates in many American cities. I believe that cleaner solutions for the building sector must meet three core objectives. They have to be affordable, cost effective, and they must be driven by consumer demand rather than government mandates. Housing affordability is my number one concern. It has been reported that housing affordability is near a 10 year low and public polling confirms 80% of Americans think housing affordability is in fact in a crisis. With a large and growing share of American households having difficulty finding housing that they can afford, this committee should be focused on ways to make housing less expensive rather than piling on more regs and driving up the costs. I'm also concerned about the cost effectiveness of some of the proposals, such as those with net zero or carbon free mandates. We need to be honest about the performance trade-offs, the higher upfront costs, and the number of years it will take to pay back the difference. We have to look at the life cycle of the products and the building itself before jumping to a one-size-fits-all regulation that does, in fact, pick technology winners and losers. Finally, I just believe that clean building solutions must be consumer-driven in order to be successful. Consumers know what they want, they know what they don't like, and they question about government telling them what they can and cannot have. Americans demand high performance, cost effectiveness, and most importantly, plenty of options to choose what works best for them. Experience has shown that consumers are turned off by expensive mandates, but they are more open to properly placed incentives. And as we think about clean solutions for the building sector, I would challenge everyone to think about clean building solutions that really do add value to their homes. With that, I look forward to the hearing. Uh, I also want to have a special welcome to Arne McIntyre, uh, who has traveled from, yes, the great state of Michigan uh, to be with us today. Uh, he's got a great perspective. He's a custom home builder, leader in energy efficiency and environmentally friendly design, state of Michigan building inspector, and he provides res research and consulting to the business uh, building sector as a whole. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlemen, you back. The chair now recognizes the esteemed chairman of the full committee, my friend from the great state of New Jersey, Mr. Pallone, for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Thank, thank you, Chairman Rush. Today's hearing is the committee's second this week and third in a series of ongoing hearings as we work to achieve 100% clean economy by 2050. On Wednesday, the Environment and Climate Change Subcommittee examined the challenges in the industrial sector, and today this subcommittee will review the U.S. building sector. We'll discuss policies to reduce pollution and save money by making our buildings more efficient. Residential and commercial buildings are responsible for nearly 40 percent of U.S. carbon pollution, more than any other sector. 
And this is not only attributable to electricity consumption, but also to the use of fossil fuels and furnaces, hot water heaters, and other building equipment and appliances. Roughly half of building floor space in the U.S. is heated by fossil fuel-fired systems. And developing a 100% clean economy by 2050 is not going to be easy, but it's absolutely necessary, and there are policies and solutions in the building sector that can help us reach that goal. Reducing pollution from buildings is tied to the power sector and how we produce electricity. Buildings account for 70% of U.S. electricity consumption, and that means making them 100% clean requires transitioning the power sector to clean, no-carbon resources like renewables and nuclear power. And perhaps the quickest and easiest way to reduce building emissions is by improving building efficiency. Existing energy efficiency measures have shown the ability to dramatically reduce building energy use and the associated operating costs for heating, cooling, and lighting. Yet there's much more we can do to accelerate and broaden the adoption of these technologies, adhering to strong building energy codes, updating federal minimum energy efficiency standards for building equipment and appliances, and bolstering federal support for programs to weatherize homes can all make a huge impact. Unfortunately, President Trump is stifling this effort to both save money and reduce carbon pollution. His administration has refused to finalize or update efficiency standards for more than a dozen consumer products. At the same time, he's rolling back efficiency standards for light bulbs, allowing inefficient products to stay on the market for years. And this wastes energy and costs consumers more money. And as, as we explore ways to reduce carbon pollution from the building sector, we have to improve the energy performance of existing buildings that will likely still be in use in 2050. So the upfront costs of retrofitting remain a barrier we must address. This committee has already taken, already acted by passing a bill authored by Chairman Tonko and Rush to increase funding for DOE's weatherization assistance program. We passed legislation by Representative Kelly to provide funds for public building efficiency upgrades, and we passed Representatives Stanton and Vesey's bill to reauthorize the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant Program. And these are all going to help, but we still need to do a lot more to meet the 2050 goal. There are several interesting ideas that I look forward to exploring today, including performance standards for existing buildings, innovative smart building controls, the use of net zero building materials and designs, and electrification of heating and cooling systems. States have often been leaders on this issue. My home state of New Jersey has a draft energy master plan that calls for electrifying the building sector by 2050 and reducing the reliance on natural gas for heating homes and buildings. And other states are making similar progress, but the federal government must also lead efforts to decarbonize commercial and residential buildings across the country. Making existing buildings more energy efficient can create jobs in every community around the country. Over 2 million Americans work in energy efficiency, and it's the fastest growing energy sector uh, in the whole country. So the widespread need for this work also creates opportunities to invest in worker training and address local unemployment in vulnerable communities. Increasing federal investment in energy efficiency will spur job growth and community development that will impact every state and district and reducing building emissions will help us address the climate crisis, obviously. It will also lower energy bills and make the buildings we live and work in more comfortable, safer, and healthier. <laughs> so I look forward to the testimony from our panel of witnesses today as we look to find solutions that will work for all of us. And with that, Mr. Chairman, unless somebody else wants, has not much time left, I yield back. The Chair yields back. Uh, Members, I want to take on just a moment for personal privilege before we entertain our uh, and listen to our witnesses. Some 15 years ago, I hired a young man on my staff who has been really have grown to me uh, such a remarkable uh, and uh, effective, brilliant young man. And a few days ago, he informed me that he would be leaving my staff to go to the private sector. And I must know that this was a few weeks after he, he got married. So uh, he married a wise woman. She made him leave in order to go make some more money. <laughs> but notwithstanding that, I just really wish us, and this man has been so much to me and to each and every one of you, I hope, and I, on his last, and this, is, this is his last hearing before in this subcommittee. Would you please join me in giving John Marshall 
I mean, round of applause. I would now like to welcome our witnesses for today's hearing. Um, Mr. Carl Elefante. Uh, he's the 2018 AIA president. That's the American Institute of Architects. Uh, he's here. Welcome, Mr. Elefante. Mr. Steve Donnell is, is the executive director of the American Council for Energy Efficiency Economy. Welcome, uh, Mr. Donnell. Mr. Dr. Curtis Zimmerman is the manager of government relations, government liaison rather, for BASF Foundation. Welcome, Mr. Zimmerman. And now I want to also uh, take a moment to especially welcome to this uh, hearing uh, and acknowledge uh, someone from my home district in Chicago, uh, Mr. Timothy Keen, who's the International Vice President at Large for the International Association of Heat and Frost Insulators and Allied Workers. Welcome, Mr. King, my friend. Uh, Mr. Arne McIntyre, who's the president of McIntyre Builders, Inc., on behalf of the National Association of Home Builders. And uh, the first year of me last, uh, and lastly, Ms. Elizabeth Beardsley, who's the senior policy counsel for the U.S. Green Building Council. I want to thank you for all for joining us here today, and we look forward to your testimony. Before we begin, uh, a part of our ritual is that there's a lighting system before you, uh, and the light will initially be green at the start of your opening statement. The light will turn yellow when uh, you have one minute remaining. Please begin to wrap up your testimony at that point. The light will turn red when your time expires. And then uh, a siren would go off if you don't uh, hear that time. Uh, Mr. Elefante, you are in my uh, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Upton, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Carl Elefante, as you already know. I'm the immediate past president of the American Institute of Architects, known as AIA. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to share what AIA and its more than 94,000 members are doing to make the nation's buildings more energy efficient. For more than 160 years, the AIA's mission has remained constant to advance our nation's quality of life and to protect the public's health, safety, and welfare. AIA's founders helped lead the fight for the then novel concept of fire codes. Today, it is unimaginable that any building would be constructed without following them. Right now, we are at a similar inflection point when it comes to the built world, specifically the necessary role of buildings to fight climate disruption. Buildings account for 75% of the electricity use in the United States and 28% of methane use. Overall, buildings represent 39% of the nation's primary energy use and greenhouse gas emissions. To reduce the impact of buildings on our environment and to make our communities healthy, secure, and resilient, AIA supports your goal of net zero emissions for the buildings by 2050. To achieve your goal, we are focused on four imperatives. First, net zero carbon building design. Second, net zero carbon renovation and retrofit. Third, net zero carbon construction and materials. And fourth, renewable energy use in buildings. Success of these initiatives will require a holistic integrated approach and long-term commitment to incorporate these strategies into the design, construction, 
operation, and maintenance of the nation's buildings. Ultimately, in the decades ahead, we want them to be as fundamental to the construction of buildings as fire and life safety codes are today. Why? Because the threat posed by climate disruptions to our homes, cities, nation, and planet require that we fundamentally re-examine how we develop and adapt the built world. To cite one example, and one that receives too little attention today, it is important to rapidly accelerate the retrofitting of existing buildings. It is estimated that in order to meet 2050 emissions targets, among, among other actions, 75% of the existing commercial and institutional building stock, 54 million square feet, billion square feet, excuse me, uh, needs to be renovated or retrofitted. That's on average nearly 2 billion square feet per year. For context, that is about four times current rates, which, by the way, are at an all-time high. That's a prime example that highlights the magnitude of the challenge. But as architects, facing big challenges is our day job. We know that appropriate standards of design and construction can be utilized to combat climate disruption. We also know that partnership with business business, civic, and elected leaders is the surest path to success. The nation's architects, engineers, developers, building product manufacturers, and others have the technical expertise needed to contribute to the fight of climate disruption. However, we can do more in partnership with you and your colleagues at the federal, state, and local levels who share your vision and our passion to transform the built environment. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can assure that buildings help achieve dramatic reductions in energy use and greenhouse gas emissions to fight climate disruption. AIA looks forward to working with you, this subcommittee, and Congress to make our nation's buildings part of the solution to climate disruption through the power of design. Again, thank you to the subcommittee for this opportunity. I look forward to your questions and our discussion this morning. The chair recognizes uh, Mr. Steve Nanell for five minutes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, ranking member, other members of the committee. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to testify here today. My organization, the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, otherwise known as ACEEE, was founded in 1980 by researchers at universities and national laboratories. We produce more than 30 reports and other research products each year on energy-saving technologies, programs, and policies. Earlier this week, ACEEE released a major report entitled, Halfway There, Energy Efficiency Can Cut Energy Use and Greenhouse Gas Emissions in Half by 2050. This report shows how energy efficiency can make a large contribution toward reaching long-term climate goals while also saving consumers and businesses money, providing jobs, improving comfort, and reducing the health impacts associated with indoor uh, air pollution. Specifically, our analysis included 11 different efficiency opportunities, which five address the building sector. Improved appliances and equipment, zero energy new buildings, smart buildings, building retrofits, and electrifying existing buildings. Overall, we estimate that the 11 opportunities can reduce 2050 U.S. energy use by about 50%, cut it in half, and also reduce carbon dioxide emissions, in this case by 57%, uh, in total reducing greenhouse gases by about 50% once we include the non-CO2 greenhouse gases. The building sector accounts for nearly 40% of U.S. energy use and emissions. We found from our five buildings measures that uh, 2050 building sector energy use could be reduced by a little over 50 percent. Uh, no single measure dominates the savings. The overall savings require the combined effect of many different measures as shown in figure one in my uh, written testimony. And they were going to try to show it on the screen, but I guess that didn't work. So we'll, oops, uh, very good. Thank you. Um, in addition, we conducted a policy analysis looking at policies to implement each of the efficiency opportunities we analyzed. Our policy analysis found a path for achieving about 90% of the efficiency opportunity we identified, a little bit more than 90% for commercial buildings, a little bit less for homes because of the difficulty convincing people to retrofit their homes. 
uh, the allocation of savings by policy is shown in figure two of my written testimony, which I believe, yes, thank you very much, which shows up there. Let me talk now a little bit more about uh, some of the policies, uh, starting with new construction. As the law of whole states, when you're in a hole, the first thing to do is stop digging. In order to address climate change, one of the first priorities is to stop building inefficient homes and buildings and instead build them as efficiently as possible. While substantial progress has been made, uh, multiple organizations are all targeting adoption of codes by 2030 that will uh, move towards uh, zero energy uh, or zero carbon uh, new homes and buildings when the energy use is summed over the course of an entire year. Such buildings typically combine high levels of energy efficiency to reduce uh, loads about 70% below typical new buildings with on-site renewable energy systems uh, to provide uh, the remaining energy. And where there is not sufficient uh, on-site uh, renewable energy, off-site renewable energy can be used. In order to encourage movement towards these types of uh, buildings, we recommend a variety of steps. First, uh, adopt uh, HR 3962, uh, rep uh, introduced by representatives uh, McKinley and uh, Welch. This includes provisions promoting regular updates of building codes, uh, as, as well as a variety of other provisions. It will not require zero energy codes, but will set up a process that uh, will further steady code improvements. Two, we recommend going beyond McKinley Wealth uh, provisions and for DOE to assist cities and states in adopting improved codes uh, as well as conducting additional research. Third, we recommend providing tax incentives for zero energy homes and uh, buildings with the incentives eventually phasing out as market share becomes substantial. And fourth, we recommend requiring that new federal buildings as of a future date be zero energy buildings in this way, the federal government can be a leader. While these buildings may cost a little bit more, uh, citations I provide in my full written testimony show how they are highly cost effective in terms of the energy savings will pay back the uh, higher cost in just a few years. Second area uh, we recommend is uh, doing more on appliances and equipment, uh, building on the appliance and equipment standards program and also uh, tax incentives to encourage the best uh, equipment. In the interest of time, I won't go into details there because I wanted to get to improvements to existing buildings, which are very important. Many of the buildings that will be standing in 2050 have already been built and we need to make them much more efficient. Uh, some of the things we should do is have the federal government again lead by example and when buildings go through major renovations, do deep energy retrofit. Likewise, the Department of Energy can do more to work uh, with cities and states on energy use be benchmarking and retrofit programs. And we also recommend expanding retrofit programs, including the Weatherization Assistance Program for low and moderate income families, as well as adoption of the HOMES Act that representatives uh, McKinley and Welch have introduced. In my written testimony, I provide a few examples of cross-cutting policies as well, and I'm happy to answer questions about those as well. But uh, since my time is up, I. Therefore, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Linnell. The chair now recognizes Dr. Zimmerman, uh, who's recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Upton, and members of the subcommittee. I am Curtis Zimmerman, Manager and Government Liaison of BSF Corporation. We truly appreciate the opportunity to testify. Would you please speak more directly into the microphone? I'm so sorry. Would you please speak more directly into the microphone? BSF Corporation is headquartered in Florham Park, New Jersey. We operate over 100 sites in 30 states, including several represented by members of the subcommittee. And BSF employs 20,000 people in North America. We are the largest chemical company globally, providing a wide range of chemistry solutions for the, all sectors of the economy. At BSF, we create chemistry for a sustainable solution, including a number of solutions for the built environment. I provided detailed examples of our chemistry innovations used in sustainable construction in my written statement, so I'll highlight just a few today, as BSF products and materials contribute to the efficiency and sustainability for the built environment across the U.S., including our own buildings. First, BSF corporate, corporate headquarters building is one of the largest sustainable buildings in the state of New Jersey. Opened in May 2012, the 325,000 square foot building features a number of BSF products and chemistries that lower its energy consumption and prolong its service life. 
designed to achieve LEED Platinum Standard and featuring high efficiency HVAC, lighting, glass, and office equipment, our building uses much less energy than a conventionally designed building. In addition to a number of water saving features and the use of recycled materials, it has a 30% improvement in indoor air quality and more than half of the energy used for our building is supplied by renewable sources. Many of our facilities have also undergone major roofing upgrades, utilizing our spray polyurethane foam technology. The seamless and monolithic application of the spray foam can be applied directly over an existing roof. This is not only improves the efficiency and durability of the roof, but also lowers labor and maintenance costs. Additionally, our facility in Huntsville, Alabama has twice been awarded the Air Pollution Control Achievement Award by the city. In 2017, the site performed an LED lighting upgrade that saved 1 million kilowatt hours, and in 2018, it achieved platinum level zero waste validation from UL, currently the only manufacturing facility in the southeast to do so. More importantly, however, is the sustainability solutions that our products provide for our customers. For example, our HP Plus wall system embodies a new way to build homes. This innovative wall works as a system and features two types of insulating foam, spray polyurethane foam and graphite-enhanced polystyrene foam called Neopore. In addition to its superior insulating performance, the design capacity of the wall is up to 130% greater than the design capacity of a standard wall, making the HP Plus wall stronger than those on typical houses. Because of its structural performance, this wall system can reduce the amount of lumber needed by up to 25%. This innovation delivers efficiency and resilience so that our customers, who are builders, can better serve their customers, the home buyer. This brings me to my last point, and that is innovation and technology deployment into the built environment. Embracing new ways to design, build, and construct homes, buildings, and infrastructure will further deliver efficiencies and sustainability across this important sector. By 2050, the world is expected to hold 9 billion people who will not only need food and clean water, but will also need shelter. How do we construct the buildings of the future that meet the demands and growing population while conserving our limited resources? What is the role of government in the process? And as, as an energy intensive company, BSF strives to be as energy efficient as possible. BSF has made efforts to play a leadership role by incorporating efficiency and sustainability into our own buildings, as well as providing those same solutions for our customers. The federal government, as the largest landlord in the U.S., has an opportunity to do the same. Government can utilize tools like energy savings performance contracts and undertake deep efficiency upgrades in its own building stock. For example, BSF has already supplied 100 million square feet of installed roofing formulations across many federal agencies, including NASA, Navy, DOE, and DOD. We appreciate these collaborations and hope that the government buildings are not unnecessarily wasting money on energy costs as that can detract from important mission-specific activities. Thank you for your opportunity to testify today about the solutions BSF is providing for the built environment. There's always more to do, and we look forward to working with you as you consider ways to further promote efficiency and sustainability across the important sector. I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you for your time. I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Zimmerman. The chair now recognizes Mr. King for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. My name is Tim Keene, and I'm the International Vice President at Large for the International Association of Heat and Frost Insulators and Allied Workers. And I greatly appreciate the opportunity to appear before the Energy Subcommittee today. Since 1903, when our union was created, our members have always been known by many names, pipe covers, asbestos workers, and now insulators. But we are and have always been the original clean energy workers. While the value of mechanical insulation has been known for many years, it is often overlooked. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for today's hearing and for this opportunity to share with you and your colleagues the importance of mechanical insulation. To summarize my testimony, Mechanical insulation is a proven energy efficient technology that promotes our national energy, economic, and environmental goals. Increased utilization of mechanical insulation saves energy for commercial buildings and industrial facilities that makes our nation more energy independent. 
The energy savings of mechanical insulation also help our economy as our manufacturing sector becomes a more competitive in the global economy. As a result of reduced fossil fuel energy consumption, mechanical insulation also reduces carbon emissions. As the House Energy and Commerce Committee and other congressional committees work to develop clean energy legislation, the insulators encourage your support for the following principles that Insulators Union General President McCourt shared with the congressional leadership last December. The reality of climate change demands that we take immediate action to reduce carbon emissions. Another important reality is that our nation will continue to require considerable fossil energy to ensure reliable baseload power for today and tomorrow. Our union does not discourage ambitious goals for a 100% clean energy economy, but our focus must be on what can be achieved now. The insulators also encourage your support for energy efficiency investments that have consistently enjoyed strong bipartisan support. Clean energy incentives should include both technologies like mechanical insulation that are already available for increased utilization and investments in research and development to promote new clean energy technologies. It is also imperative that clean energy legislation contain bipartisan building trades labor standards, Davis-Bacon prevailing wages, use of project labor agreements to ensure that clean energy jobs are good jobs. These labor standards recognize that clean energy infrastructure should be built by the best trained and most productive and safest construction workers. The insulators support many specific legislative proposals to increase the use of mechanical insulation that you can see in my written statement. Energy efficiency is often considered the fifth fuel behind coal, oil and natural gas, nuclear and renewable energy, but for this committee, energy efficiency should be considered the first fuel because the cheapest and cleanest energy is the energy that is conserved. As I conclude my testimony, I have focused on what the insulators are doing to achieve a clean economy. But I also want to recognize the important energy efficiency work that other building trades unions perform. It is unfortunate that some characterize building trades jobs as dirty or temporary jobs. The truth is that building trades unions and our contractors invest 1.3 billion per year in our apprenticeship programs that produce the best trained, safest, and most productive craft workers for long-term careers. As Chairman Rush knows, one of the best apprenticeship programs in the nation is my home local 17 that is located in Chairman Rush's district. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm looking forward to continuing this important conversation as we work to build a clean economy. Thank you. Chair, sure, thanks, uh, Mr. Keen. And now the chair recognizes Mr. McIntyre, who is recognized for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Rush, Ranking Member Upton, members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to appear before you today on behalf of the National Association of Home Builders. I would like to share our views regarding energy use within residential buildings and solutions that encourage energy efficiency that are market-driven and voluntary without jeopardizing housing affordability. My name is Arne McIntyre. I'm a green builder from Grand Rapids, Michigan. My company has focused on designing and constructing high-performance homes for 25 years. Most notably, my company built the first independently certified green home in Michigan, in the state of Michigan, in 2002. I also served as one of the founding members of the committee that developed the first national green building standard in 2008, the NGBS. As longtime leaders in the drive to make new and existing homes more efficient, one of the biggest challenges to <clears throat> continues to be balance and efficiency with housing affordability. As energy efficiency standards become more stringent, home prices increase for new home buyers. In fact, 
NHB estimates that if the medium U.S. new home price goes up $1,000, more than 127,000 households would be priced out of the market or out of housing nationwide. First and foremost, Congress must factor in housing affordability when looking at solutions for a 100% clean economy. According to the 2018 study of the Environmental Information Agency Administration, the residential sector uses approximately 16% of the energy consumed in the United States. That's the residential sector. Because new homes account for a small share of a total housing inventory, they use only a small share of the annual consumption. In contrast, there are 130 million homes built uh, prior to 2010 that are much less energy efficient than today's new homes. Therefore, in addition to housing affordability, any efforts to address the energy consumption of homes must prioritize the inefficiencies of existing homes over the higher performing new homes. I would also caution the committee against proposing federal mandates as a solution to building a 100% clean economy. Mandating energy building codes or requiring builders to reach net zero or near zero energy emissions and usage is extremely difficult, costly, and is not consumer driven. Many have suggested that mandates are an answer to improving residential energy efficiency and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. These are highly problematic and have unintended consequences. As a Michigan State licensed building inspector and home energy rater, I, have, I am involved in the code process. To simply mandate compliance with more stringent energy codes makes little sense. Since the codes are developed at a national level, many of the energy efficiency provisions are based on national construction and cost savings which are of limited use on a local level. Further, because new construction is already highly efficient, requiring compliance with more stringent energy codes yields minimal overall benefits, yet can impose significant cost to new home construction. Finally, any federal intrusion into the building codes adoption process could have catastrophic impact on each state's ability to implement codes that best fit their needs. Instead of focusing on mandates, to reach its clean economy goals, Congress should support and facilitate voluntary above code programs. Unlike mandates, these are driven by the market, recognized by consumers, and result in verifiable reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Programs such as the ICC 700, the National Green Building Standard, LEED, Energy Star, and DOE's Better Building Program all have proven track records for, for reducing usage, energy usage and meeting other sustainability and high performance goals. Multiple options of flexibility allow us as builders to choose the energy efficiency option that meets our individual needs for the market. In conclusion, I strongly urge Congress to promote voluntary market-driven and viable green building initiatives in lieu of mandates to meet energy efficiency goals. These types of programs reduce lower total ownership costs through utility savings as well as provide the flexibility of builders Builders need to construct homes that are cost-effective, affordable, and meet consumer demand. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. I strongly recommend that Congress seriously consider and address the housing affordability when exploring solutions for a 100% clean economy. Thank you. I want to thank you, Mr. McIntyre. The chair now recognizes Ms. Beardsley uh, for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks to the leadership and members of the subcommittee. I'm honored to join you today on behalf of the U.S. Green Building Council, a nonprofit organization. We're best known for our leadership in energy and environmental design, LEED Green Building System. Through LEED and other initiatives, we drive sustainable and high-performing buildings that improve the quality of life for all. We thank the subcommittee for this attention to progress on buildings in support of the 100 by 50 goal. While climate risks are ever more apparent and urgent, the good news is that we can do this. The solution set is robust and growing to meet the challenge. This is certainly true in the building sector where we have much of the technology and can start now. Deep efficiency is possible and being achieved every day in places like Texas where a recent story reported on a family power bill being cut in half after they rebuilt to modern code post Harvey. We can deploy these cost-effective common sense solutions and reduce emissions along the way while creating jobs. The recent Energy Efficiency Jobs in America report finds this, to be, this sector to be one of the nation's biggest employers, as noted by the chairman. 
In fact, building technologies are getting so good, available, and low cost that net zero is no longer merely an aspiration, but increasingly a reality. For example, this year we recognized the Entergy office in Little Rock as the first LEED Zero certified building in the US, and others are in the pipeline. And the New Buildings Institute Net Zero database shows more than 600 buildings that are verified or emerging as net zero energy. Net zero buildings are on the rise because these high performing buildings are cost effective over their life cycle. When you build or retrofit a building to utilize smart technology, modern efficient heating and cooling, highly insulated envelopes, and add on-site renewable energy, the result's a highly cost-effective, resilient, and comfortable building. Study after study shows that high-performing buildings are valued in the commercial market with price and rent premiums, improvement in net operating income, and faster lease-up times. Just this week, a new report from USGBC Massachusetts showed that net-zero buildings can be built with little to no additional cost meaning payback times were as short as a year. And they found that existing office buildings retrofitted to net energy with renewables can produce a return on their investment in five to six years. As for single family homes, the Rocky Mountain Institute studied the incremental costs of building net zero homes in four US locations. RMI found the cost to build a zero energy ready home to be between 0.9% to 2.5% over a comparable cold home and concluded the cost increase is modest, far less than consumers, builders, and policymakers realize while predicting costs will continue declining over time. To put in perspective the benefits, the Discovery School across the river in Arlington is a net zero, net, net zero energy school. With the money saved from utility bills, the school has funded two additional full-time teachers this year. And in the federal space, the NREL campus in Colorado features a net zero building built at costs within the regional construction cost average. With these positive trends, we see many options for bipartisan progress on a suite of approaches. Not every building needs to be net zero, but we can aim to give everyone the opportunity to benefit from modern, modern building methods on new buildings and retrofits to optimize energy efficiency. Even while cost effective improvements even when cost-effective, improvements face other real and perceived barriers that are hindering progress. Policy has a critical role in accelerating implementation, and a suite of approaches can best speed the rate of adoption while enabling continued American innovation. Our statement includes a wide range of measures for consideration. To highlight a few, first, we should reestablish and expand federal agency targets for annual improvements in energy efficiency renewable energy, and other key metrics, and make needed changes to unlock the use of contracting mechanisms that leverage private funds for public efficiency and renewable projects. Second, federal agencies have a number of existing programs providing funds to state and local governments used for construction. These programs should ensure that federally funded buildings are highly efficient and resilient, protecting federal investment and aligning outcomes with goals. Additional programs could help seed states and cities in improving public buildings. Third, we see many positive improvements in the private sector. Financial incentives can help bring attention to these potential savings, including to small business, which may lack technical capacity. Different financial models and ensuring efficiency is properly valued can also break down barriers. Transitioning our building sector to be high performing and resource efficient is financially beneficial and is taking place now throughout the country. The building sector could represent significant progress towards the 100 by 50 goal. To accelerate this transformation, an integrated set of strategies are called for. I look forward to discussing more in the questions. Thank you. I want to thank all the witnesses. We have now concluded opening statements, and we will now move to member questionings. Questions. Each member will have five minutes to ask questions of our witnesses. And I will start by recognizing myself for five minutes. <clears throat> Mr. King, uh, I want to thank you for joining us here this morning, and I appreciate your willingness to work uh, with my office to hold the Energy Efficiency Job Readiness Fair early next year in my district. My office will follow up with you to confirm the, the logistics, and we are eager to work with Local 17 uh, chapter of the insulators 
to provide, to provide you with hardworking, qualified candidates to help swell the ranks of your union. Uh, <clears throat> my office, uh, Mr. King, receiving information <clears throat> regarding some of the programs that you conduct in my district, including the St. Paul Community Development Program, the South Suburban Highway to Construction Career Program, and the Chicago Women in Trades Program. Can you briefly summarize what each of these programs do and how an interested candidate may enlist in, uh, in each of these programs and the impact of each of these programs on uh, energy efficiency? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. When we go to these different, these different sectors, when we're doing our reach out, okay, it, it, it's an umbrella. We try to hit as many places as we can to make sure that we reach out to all communities. Um, with the Women Build Nations, that's, that's a, a, a big movement for our ladies in the trades to uh, express how being a tradeswoman is. As far as the reach outs to the different communities and the, the, the different groups with Mrs. Ford, we want, we want the communities to know that we're there, that we're there for their people, that we offer not just jobs, we offer careers. And we want to really, really bring it home with our people, all across the all across the board, especially in um, Illinois and in, in Chairman Rush's in your district, we want to we want to reach out to the people. We want them to learn as they earn with an apprenticeship. And and the big thing is, after after their five year apprenticeship, they were they were paid to learn for five years, and now they're going into the job market with not just a job, Mr. Chairman, but a career. Very not much. Uh, Mr. Elefante, my office will be partnering with the Argonne uh, National Laboratories, Commonwealth Edison, the Illinois uh, Tech, uh, Institute of Technology, and other organizations in one of the poorest neighborhoods in my city, in the Inglewood community, to de develop uh, affordable energy efficient housing that can be used as a national uh, model. <clears throat> And I would like to follow up with your organization, the um, AIA, to work uh, with these housing uh, developers uh, and that will consist of some of the most innovative energy efficient designs possible. Uh, I would like to work with you if I can follow up with you and uh, get your uh, organization to work with us. Would that be something that you may be interested in? Yeah. Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. Thank yeah. you for the question. Uh, uh, housing design has always, of course, been a really important part of what we do. If you look at the, the statistics of the building stock, uh, housing is, uh, you know, an enormous uh, part of it. 325 billion square feet of building in the United States of America. About 2 billion square feet of that is single-family residential. Uh, the, the, the remaining 130 plus billion square feet is somewhat equally divided between multifamily housing, commercial and institutional buildings. So each one of them is an enormous sector. Uh, our work with affordable housing uh, has shown that uh, uh, housing affordability and energy efficiency are not uh, oxymorons that, that uh, don't go together. Uh, but actually both can be achieved together. So we'd be happy to work with you to really demonstrate that affordability and energy efficiency support each other. The last thing I'll say on it is, is to just simply say that one of the things that I can say from my own work uh, in the state of Michigan, for example, uh, is uh, that you end up with an affordable housing unit that then has very low utility bills in the na nature of something like 20%. Uh, and that's a, that's, a, that's a gift that keeps on giving. Mm -hmm. uh, Chair, uh, out of time, the Chair now recognizes Mr. Upton for five minutes for the purposes of an opening statement. 
I mean, Question. <laughs> questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I know that we're going to be pressed for time because of the votes that are going to occur shortly. So let me just yield the first part of my time to Mr. Griffith from Virginia for. Thank you very much. I appreciate you yielding. Uh, as many of you may have seen yesterday, uh, led by some uh, Cornell Lab ornithology scientists, a report came out that the breeding population of birds in the U.S. and Canada has dropped nearly 30% since 1970. The good news is, is as we're making buildings more efficient, and particularly when we're dealing with glass, we can make bird safe buildings as well. Nearly a billion birds, estimates run from anywhere from 100 million, 640 million to a billion birds a year, collide with buildings and die. Accordingly, I would ask, instead of going through all the testimony, I would ask that uh, we have unanimous consent to submit reports on how we can have both energy efficient and bird safe buildings. And I would mention that the American Bird Conservancy has uh, shouted out uh, yesterday that one of the ways to solve the problem is a bill that Mr. Quigley and I have introduced, and Mr. Welch and I are currently working on an amendment to his energy bill that uh, would incorporate some of this language. Uh, you hear no objections, so on. And I yield back. Thank, thank, thank you, uh, my friend. Uh, Mr. McIntyre, uh, state and local governments do, as we know, play a very key role in the code's adoption process, and I believe that it should stay, I believe that it ought to stay that way because state and local governments have a better hand on how nationally developed codes are gonna work in practice, particularly as you look at north, south, east, and west. Why is it so important to tailor codes to local conditions, local market forces, and consumer demands? Well, first Versus a one size fit, fits all. First and foremost, um, our code process now is a consensus code process, and it's a, it's a vigorous uh, consensus driven. It's input from industry, input from um, code officials, input from builders, input from associations. So it's driven by consensus. Then that drafts the, the overall code or the national code that then can go to the states that the states can adopt to their choosing. They can modify it for local conditions, they can adjust it for local conditions, they can adopt it statewide, as in the case of Michigan, with, with modifications for the state of Michigan, which are important to meet the needs of the consumer and the market in our state. States also have the choice that they want to add to that code if they choose, as other states have. So having that flexibility as builders of the market, markets are not the same across the country. They're not the same within, an, within a state. Having the ability to adopt the code, and this is the code officials in the industry that are, are consensus that are doing this at the state level, is very critical to have that flexibility to deliver the product that the consumer is demanding. That's the key. The consumer, if we want this to scale, the key is developing a product, a house is a product, developing a product that the consumer wants in the area that the consumer wants it in and deliver that product to them cost effectively and it'll go to scale. Having the ability to adopt local codes or, or adjust to local codes is important for that reason. So as we all think about energy conservation, uh, how valuable would it be, or, or is it done very much now where a new buyer <coughs> sitting down with a, a builder uh, to actually see an audit as to what the energy efficiency will be for that home, whether it be glass, uh, heating and cooling, water, electrical use uh, based on the, the size of the... Yeah, you're referring to an energy audit? Right. That part of the value uh, that we need, that the consumer needs to realize, they have to see and realize what they're, what they're going to but get. But is that done now? Does and it's, starting, it's, th it's starting to be done. The folks, we do it. The folks that are doing building high-performance homes are doing it. We're doing it voluntarily. We... We have a history of the houses we've built. We've built hundreds of houses that are high-performing homes, low HERS, Energy Star, uh, Energy Value Housing houses. We have record of, of what it costs to build them, what it costs to how they perform and to live in. And we can start showing that to consumers and then we can model through, through software what the performance of their projected home is and give them that, I'll say, comfort level of how their house is gonna perform. When a consumer comes through the door, 10, 10 years ago, don't ask me why that's going off. Hopefully it's your wife. Shut off. Um, <laughs> uh, geez. 
It's a robocall, but we're going to stop those. Uh, yeah, we, we passed the bill to, to get that done. Uh -huh. When the consumer comes through the door, 10 years ago, they weren't looking for energy efficiency. Today, when they come through our door, they're looking for it because they know we have the ability to deliver that value. Yep. And that's what they ask for. So we show them that, we show them some history, and then we're on our way to going down that road with them. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Pallone, uh, the chairman of the full committee, for five minutes for the purpose of an opening statement. Thank you, Question. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Rush. Our witnesses today have testified that more than half of the residential and commercial buildings that will be standing in 2050 have already been built. And as we look for ways to achieve net zero emissions by that year, we'll have to find effective ways to eliminate emissions from these existing buildings. Um, I'm actually glad they'll still be standing. I like old buildings. I, I don't want to knock them down. But my first question will be for either, um, either Mr. Nade or Mr. Beardsley or Mr. Elephant. We know that efficiency can go a long way in decarbonizing existing buildings, but we need to do more than just maximize efficiency. So just talk to us about some policy levers we can pull today to reduce or eliminate emissions from buildings beyond just improving the energy efficiency. And I'll, I'll start with Mr. Nadel, if we could. Yes, there are a variety of policies that can be pursued. And in particular, let me pick up on something that Mr. Upton was asking about. Do we provide information to home buyers on the energy efficiency of homes before they buy it? Uh, for example, the city of Portland, Oregon requires that when you put a home on the market, you provide a 1 to 10 rating. It's called the home energy score. And this is information that the homeowner can consider as they uh, buy the home. And in particular, since so many homeowners improve their homes right after buying, it can be a, a, a powerful incentive. So that would be one thing. Uh, we do endorse the Homes Act that uh, uh, Representatives McKinley and Welch have introduced. How do we encourage people to make those improvements, uh, likewise improving, increasing the weatherization assistance program, particularly for uh, low moderate income families, uh, as well as in tax incentives? But let me right. let, let me Mr. Uh, well, Mr. Beardsley, I guess, or Ms. Beardsley, I'm sorry. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's a great question because uh, we talk a lot about energy efficiency and that's the core, but actually there's a lot of other pieces to a high-performing green building that can contribute um, to reducing emissions and reducing their energy use. So if you think about water, so if we're connected to a public water system, that takes energy to, um, to withdraw that water, to treat it, to pump it to your house or your building. So if you're conserving water in your building, that's also reducing energy of the system at large. Um, similarly, if you're using uh, a landscape that is lower water using, or you're using rain barrels or cisterns or other methods that are um, less needing potable water, that also reduces that energy. And then on the material side, there's lots of choices and innovation. This is a great area for the U.S. economy to move ahead in different material options. and. Um, even with, uh, with green building, there's an intent to try to reduce construction waste. So buildings are planned and built in such a way that there's reduced waste and it's often reused in other ways or recycled for other products down the road um, rather than going to a landfill or incinerator. And these all contribute to reducing emissions. Thank you. All right, thank you. Mr. Elephant? Well, thank you. Uh, I'd just like to kind of build on both of those uh, comments. First, uh, to the benchmarking, the, the value of data in this. And I would just uh, remind everybody the importance of the U.S. Uh, Inf Energy Information Agency's database. Uh, I, everything that we do, and if from any kind of a policy or program uh, point of view, we have to go back and really look at the data, understand what the impact is, the importance that that, that, of the work that, of that agency. I just wanted to underscore we really need that data to understand what our practices need to be. Um, and then uh, just relating to what Ms. Beardsley just said about these other factors, I would just sort of put it out there be, to be thinking about the associated benefits of energy efficiency. And I particularly point to health benefits that uh, uh, we went to a global energy efficiency uh, conference last year, and, and really that was the nature of that conversation. And I just 
would just kind of remind everybody that thinking about these associated benefits uh, to the kind of central goals here are actually the kind of win-win that really helps drive the market and really helps uh, articulate the value of these energy efficient uh, goals that we're seeking. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, now I recognize Mr. Lado for uh, questioning. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to our witness for appearing before us today. Uh, through this hearing today, it is my desire that we will continue to focus on improving energy efficiency, which should be a bipartisan issue. One of the most successful programs for promoting energy efficiency and benefit customers, manufacturers, and the environment is the Energy Star program. The Energy Star program is a voluntary program run by the Environmental Protection Agency and the Department of Energy. It allows manufacturers to obtain Energy Star labeling for products if specific energy savings guidelines are met, benefiting consumers that are looking to purchase high efficiency energy products. I believe that one way we can improve the energy efficiency in the building sector is to strengthen this important program. That is why I introduced the bipartisan HR 2104, the Energy Star Program Integrity Act, along with my good friend, the gentleman from Vermont. This bill fixes a gap in the federal law by prohibiting the pursuit of private litigation against manufacturers that comply with, com with corrective compliance measures that were approved by the EPA. This will ensure the Energy Star program will operate as intended by maintaining robust, voluntary participation by the manufacturers. If I could uh, start my questioning with you, uh, Dr. Zimmerman, and uh, also I do have a, a BAS plant in my district in White House, Ohio, in which I have visited on many occasions. And it is my understanding that BASF Corporation has sought out the Energy Star label for many of its products. Uh, would you go into uh, some detail about these products and how they help create more energy efficient homes and buildings? Thank you for the question, Mr. Congressman. Uh, BSF has a variety of products right now that do enhance energy efficiency, such as spray polyurethane foam, which is a very good example of that. Uh, these products bring not only reduced energy utilization, but they also provide resilience as well through water barrier protection and also barrier wrap protection. These are very good products. Other products we have, like our Green Sense Concrete, uh, these, these are not just product names, it's more of a philosophy around developing cement formulations that can really utilize local ingredients that reduce the carbon footprint so they are used in place. A great example of that is Portland cement can be replaced with recyclable material, locally found material, again, leading to a reduced carbon footprint in the application of those materials. Uh, a variety of other products, again, from an Energy Star perspective, you know, greatly reduce the energy of manufacturing, the carbon footprint, the greenhouse gas emissions during both manufacturing and use as well. Oh, so it is very important for your company to, to participate in the Energy Star program. It's, it's very important, and also we utilize our own products and our own facilities to ensure that they're running energy efficient. Do you think there is a uh, merit in strengthening the voluntary programs like Energy Star so that uh, more companies can continue to innovate with energy efficient products? Companies like BSF will continue to innovate products for more energy efficiency because we have incentive to do that. We certainly don't want to waste energy because it costs money. Uh, I think uh, strengthening the program that allows for more voluntary adoption would be very good for manufacturers. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McIntyre, uh, uh, let me turn my questions to you if I may. In your testimony, you specifically cite the Energy Star program as a successful program with a proven track record in reducing energy usage in part due to its voluntary uh, nature. Uh, would you explain uh, uh, to us why this program is so popular in the home building industry? Well, the Energy Star program is one of several, and it's, it's I'll say it's somewhat the pinnacle of, of a high-performance home. You can, that can be argued to a degree. But the point is, uh, when a consumer comes through your door, they are, for the most part, they want a performing home. They don't know what that means necessarily. You've got to explain that to them to a degree. And you have a HERS-rated home. You have an Energy Star home. You have green homes that you can do. 
We spend the time to go through and explain to them what the difference in performance is and how you get there, the systems approach, how you address the envelope, how you address the air sealing, how you address mechanical systems. And then we give them the option. We tell them we HERS rate every home. A HERS rating is, is a energy rating, some mile per gallon sticker for your home. We tell them we rate every home. Here's where our homes generally score. That starts to give them a feel that, okay, they're confidence. We show them some of the energy simulations if they, if they want to get to that level of detail. And then we offer to certify the home for Energy Star. Uh, and then we also offer green building programs if they want. And about 25 to maybe 30% of our customers will want to go for the Energy Star certification. Uh, right now, we're a small home builder. Uh, we used to be a lot bigger, we, uh, but uh, we scaled back at the recession and kind of like it that way now. But, uh, um, and we, so we have right now, we have one Energy Star home in certification, two of them in process. That's probably the max we would have at any one time being built. Uh, but we leave it up to the consumer to make that Mr. choice. Mr. McIntyre, when you bring your comment to, to thank, thank you very much to the witness. And Mr. Chairman, my time has expired and I yield back. Uh, well, thank the gentleman. I want to remind members that between 10.15 and 10.30, they are most expected on the floor. So uh, uh, with that, I want to recognize now Mr. McNerney for five minutes for the for question. I thank the chairman. I thank the witnesses this morning. Uh, very interesting testimony. So let's take a hypothetical 50-year-old uh, home somewhere on the coast of California, maybe 22,000 square feet. Um, what's the payback time for retrofitting that for energy efficiency? Mrs. Beardley, if you'd like to take that. Uh, Excuse me. Um, thank you for the question. It really depends on, you know, what the fuel rates are, what fuel they're currently using, um, what the options are in that. But generally, um, the paybacks, as we've seen in some of these studies, can be very small, you know, it could be a couple of years to maybe seven to 10 years, but we, I can answer in detail on the record. Mr. McIntyre, looks like you want to say <laughs> something. I was just wondering if that was a general question, I didn't catch that part of it. So, it, I, I concur to a degree of what uh, Ms. Beardley just said, it depends on what you're doing to it, uh, the types of retrofits you're doing and how far you're going with it. But what's important, that's a key piece to the value that we talked about. As consumers start to see that return, whether it's in their energy bills or whether it's in their gas bills or electric bills, they start to see that return, that value, then they start incurring more, they'll, they'll pay more, they'll, they'll do more as they see that value. And it's a key to get them to understand that. Once you get the market to start understanding that, they know there's true payback there, then the market will take over and start driving it, which it is starting to do. So, uh, Mr. Nadell, could you give Nadell, could you give me some idea of how much regional variation there would be in that answer? You know, is there a huge difference between, say, Michigan and California in terms of payback? There definitely will be regional variation. Paybacks tend to be quicker in colder climates like Michigan. California is a very diverse state. So, are you talking the Sierras? Or are you talking, you know, the desert? Uh, but it will vary. On the other hand, in California, they use a lot less, uh, they use a lot less energy um, to begin with. Okay, thank you again, Mr. Data. Nadeau, um, can time shifting of energy requirements uh, for homes be realistic, say, to, to sync better with renewable energy? Uh, definitely, there are opportunities to uh, shift the time that energy is used, particularly, you know, if you add a little thermal mass to the home or uh, include a modest amount of storage. Uh, California, as I'm sure you well know, is moving to time of use rates, and we expect a lot more of that happening in California. Well, one of the frequently cited concerns with regard to electrification is the operating cost. Is there a way to restructure uh, utility billing to, to sort of levelize that? problem? I mean, I think the general trend is to have time of use rates so that the rate varies depending on the cost to produce. But then as you're designing the retrofits, as you're doing electrification, you need to uh, add a little bit of storage and think about it. How can you uh, do more of your heating and cooling during those off-peak times and glide through the times when the period is high? And yes, that can be done. All right, in the interest of time, I'm going to yield back early, Mr. Chairman. 
Chair, thanks and gentlemen. Chair now recognizes Ms. McMorris Rogers for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As, as many of you know, I'm proud of how Eastern Washington has been leading the country in clean energy solutions, such as clean, renewable, reliable, affordable hydropower. As we discuss ways to increase building efficiency, I also wanted to highlight a way that we are leading, and that is cross-laminated timber. CLT is strong, sustainable, and a renewable, low-carbon building material, and it has the potential to significantly increase the energy efficiency of buildings. There are two uh, CLT manufacturers in the United States, and they're both right now in eastern Washington, Boggan Timbers in Colville and Katerra in Spokane Valley. In Spokane, Avista Utilities is working to develop an eco-district center, uh, uh, center in our community that it will be that will include one of the most sustainable buildings in the country using cross laminated timber. And and later on today, Katera is un unveiling its new state of the art factory which will produce the highest volume of CLT in North America. These eastern Washington companies are on the cutting edge of building a more efficient and sustainable future. I'm excited about what the potential of new and innovative building materials and processes such as CLT have economic growth for rural communities, a cleaner environment, stronger buildings, and better forest management. So it really is, it's a, it's a rural job solution, it's a timber solution, but it's also better forest management solution, but it also is part of the carbon solution. Mr. Elenfant, do you agree that the properties of CLT, mainly in strength, flexibility, sustainability, and ability to se sequester carbon, make it an ideal material to build more energy efficient mid-level buildings? So I think that the uh, most important uh, thing about CLTs is that they indicate uh, what an innovative future would look like where we consider carbon sequestration as one of the factors. Uh, I talked about the four things that we in the building sector understand that we must do. One of them is essentially embodied carbon, which you know the CLT uh, technology is a terrific example of not just looking for uh, products that are more energy efficient, but actually have this additional benefit of actually sequestering carbon in the actual material itself. There's a lot of innovation happening in that area. I would say that at this point, the CLT technology is kind of the poster child of just how, uh, how many layers of benefit can come from uh, looking at that sort of innovation. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to move on to another important issue in Eastern Washington, and that is housing affordability. And like many areas in the country, we are experiencing a serious crisis in affordable housing. We've consistently heard about the desire to mandate net zero buildings across the country. I have concerns about how this is going to impact housing costs and how it might only add to the current affordability crisis that we're in. It's going to be difficult for me to support any legislation that would make it more difficult to find affordable housing as a result of additional government mandates. Mr. McIntyre, given your experience building green homes, how much more would it cost to go to net zero? Well, one of the key items with net zero, the first thing to get to net zero is you got to optimize the envelope. You got to reduce your load. Uh, that's done a number of ways. It's done by the, the, the shape of the structure, the configuration of the structure. It doesn't matter how you build it or what you build it out. It's just a simple shape. Uh, and then it's the materials you build it out to reduce the load. But it's, I think it's a pretty fair statement to say that to get to net zero, it's going to require renewables or something to that effect. Uh, and that's where the additional cost really comes in at this point. To get to an optimized home uh, from, a, I'll say, a standard built home, you're, you're talking a few thousand dollars, five to fifteen thousand dollars in that range, uh, could be as high as twenty. When you go to net zero, now we're looking at renewables of some sort. Uh, I personally just put in a 12 kilowatt system on our farm. Uh, and I did that work all myself, and I did it because it makes sense now, because we have net metering, there's tax incentives, and the cost of solar has come down because it's scaled much more than it was 15, 20 years ago. So now that 
that they're more affordable, it makes sense to do. But they were still $18,000 for me, and I installed all of it. Actually, it was more like $20,000, and I installed it all. That system quoted to me was about $40,000. So the difference in cost really starts coming in the PV. That's where getting to scale, getting that consumer recognition, which is solar, we're starting to see. We have net metering in Michigan, and now we're seeing solar panels pop up, small panels all over in yards and homesteads around Michigan. Thank you. Uh, now I recognize uh, Mr. Lumsang for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Rice, Ranking Member Upton, and thank you to the witnesses for being here today as well. It's been a great discussion. And I personally want to thank my friend, uh, Mr. Tonko, for letting me go ahead of him. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, when it comes to tackling the climate crisis, we must be committed to finding solutions that reduce emissions now and that grow our economy and create good jobs in our communities. And I think any investments in infrastructure across the country must drive down the costs for Iowans, where I'm from, particularly those in the rural communities, promote the production and expansion of renewable energy sources and create jobs. I want to shift the focus a little bit to schools, if I could. Uh, today, we are specifically looking at ways to reduce emissions and improve energy efficiency in the U.S. building sector, but I recently introduced legislation to help achieve this goal in our nation's school buildings. This is the Renew America's Schools Act. This bill, which has been included in the Lift America infrastructure proposal, would award $100 million over the course of five years to help schools modernize and make critical energy efficient upgrades to their facilities. And uh, to add to that, the legislation also sets aside a percentage of funding to be used for educational programming for students around the efficiency upgrade so they know what this all means for them and for future generations. And they can take that home to their parents as well, by the way. I think that's a part of this that's really important. This is a win-win for workers, students, and parents. It will help create jobs, reduce emissions, and produce long-term cost savings for our schools due to increased energy efficiency, all while providing our students with top-notch learning environments and educating them about the importance of clean and efficient energy technologies. We know that the environment in which our students learn and educators teach can have an immense impact on the quality of education our children receive. My wife was a second grade teacher for over 30 years, so she's very aware of that. And unfortunately, many of our nation's schools are in a really sad state of disrepair, as I think everyone here knows. First, uh, I'd like to go to Ms. Bardley for a couple questions. In your testimony, you highlighted some of the advances being made both in new and existing school facilities. First question, can you elaborate on what you think are the most effective upgrades that existing schools can make to their facilities in order to significantly reduce emissions and improve their efficiency in the short term? Thank you, and we really appreciate your sponsoring the schools bill. That's really important. Um, with the existing schools, it's much like other existing buildings. So the basics are improving the envelope and upgrading the HVAC systems um, the lighting, um, but you know, with schools, as you alluded to, with students, we, there's so much research. Our Center for Green Schools has collected much of this. Um, we've done a state of our schools uh, report a few years ago, showing the state of the nation's schools and the need for this reinvestment in school infrastructure. Um, we uh, know that students learn best when the indoor environmental quality is very high, so CO2 levels and oxygen and also when there's daylight and there's connection with nature. So uh, schools are a really special environment and they're really important to not just the students but the whole community. Um, so there's really a lot that can be done there to increase efficiency, um, use it as a living laboratory, and really uh, help that connect with the community's goals. Well, thank you, you've kind of uh, answered the second question but you might want to add a little bit to that. What are some of the most significant co-benefits that you expect to see? when schools make improvements to their facilities outside of reduced emission and lower energy costs. Mm -hmm. Right, so we would see um, with the indoor, improved indoor air quality, there would be um, improved conditions for student learning. Uh, you may have better wellness, so reduced sick days, um, and that includes the teachers as well, the staff. Um, and really like uh, having that benefit of the increased connection with nature and daylight, which has been proven to support learning. Thank you. So. I do love going to brand new schools that uh, incorporate a lot of the technologies we're talking about today, but I really would like to see more of the older schools be able to do exactly the mm -hmm. same things and be upgraded. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the schools throughout the country, building, buildings often lack proper heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems. 
Energy costs for K-12 schools total approximately $8 billion annually nationwide, but according to the EPA, $2 billion of those dollars can be saved by improving energy efficiency. This cost is equivalent to about 40 million new textbooks or hiring an additional 50,000 teachers at current salaries. We need to think about the opportunity costs there. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Upton for having this hearing and thanks to the witnesses. And in particular, I wanna thank my colleague, Mr. Tonko for letting me go before him. Thank you. The chair, thanks, uh, the gentleman. The chair now recognizes my friend from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, look, as a professional engineer, I've probably spent 50 years, nearly 50 years in the construction sector, uh, specifying a lot of low energy, uh, low use, uh, high, uh, low energy use and high efficiency bill. In fact, my company, by 15, 20 years ago, we were some of the first designing LEED certified buildings uh, in this country, yeah, and certainly in West Virginia. Um, and we tried to do this working with um, uh, my fellow colleague from Ver Vermont. We've been able to try to get some accomplishments but uh, uh, in energy efficiency, and I appreciate Mr. Nadel, uh, you're underscoring two of our bills that we're working on, and I think that we can advance those. But I, 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 and I guess I don't want it to be a, a but on there, but there is a, there is a concern. And, and Elizabeth, you were the first, you've mentioned it now for the first time, mm -hmm. was indoor air quality. And I've been troubled as an engineer that we tend to ignore that, the impact that indoor air quality is gonna have effect on it. And because it's really gonna stress our ability to get energy efficient, or excuse me, energy reductions costs. Because we know that typically a classroom today it may be at best, it has one air turnover an hour. It may be at best. But under ASHRAE standards, it wants us to go anywhere from four to 20 air changes an hour. So we know we're gonna be putting a lot more energy into our buildings as a result of that to achieve good indoor air quality. So little Johnny sitting there next to someone sneezing or having some disease, whatever in the carbon dioxide buildup in that classroom is gonna affect his or her health. So I know we're gonna have some impact on that. So my, I'm a little curious about how we might be able to explain to people their energy demands are gonna go up because they're currently not meeting a good air quality in our classrooms. So I'm curious to see how we might be able, so that if, with full disclosure, the people understand their energy costs actually might go up, but they're, air quality is gonna improve, and little Johnny and his sister are gonna be healthier when they get out of that classroom. Can you work with me a little bit on how we might be able to, to get the public to be more aware that we're gonna, we're gonna challenge energy for a while? Yep, thanks, Representative. And I do have to mention that I'm a frequent visitor to the beautiful Canaan Valley uh, all winter, so. Um, yeah, so with schools, again, as with other buildings, uh, what we, promote is a whole building approach. And that's really where you can get the most benefit and the most potential cost savings. Um, even if you improve your air quality with increased uh, mechanical air changes in that example, if you're looking at the whole building and you're upgrading your lighting, say you're going from uh, old incandescent up to LED, you're adding more daylighting with more better insulated windows, you're upgrading your HVAC. If you really look at it as a whole systems approach, that's where you can save money even at the same time you as could, you're I guess, but increasing. you say it could be offset with the zero. Because mm -hmm. I think it's important for people to understand we're gonna hit with, if we do the proper air changes, mm -hmm. we're gonna increase at least that component of it. And I agree with you on lighting other elements to it, but I think we need a full disclosure to make sure people are aware some component might actually increase, but the rest of it we can offset. It's, it's an educational process we have to do with it. Yep. So Mr. Nato, in the time frame that I, unfortunately we get, one of the most controversial parts of the, that we're getting pushed back on our, our legislation uh, has to do with the, the introduction of the, uh, the building, uh, building energy codes. Um, what, what, from your perception, what's wrong with the 10-year payback requirement? I think a 10-year payback is okay if you have the adequate financing, so therefore, are your loan payments, the extra loan payments are uh, less than the energy savings. In that case, you get immediate positive cash flow. And with mortgage rates today, typically that will be the case. 
So would you suggest that we should stay the course on this or should we give more flexibility to go beyond 10 years? What do you think we should do? Um, I think uh, staying the course is good, but yes, maybe some flexibility. Interest rates go up and down. You know, ultimately it should be, if you're gonna recommend anything rather than an arbitrary period, talk about a media positive cash flow and finance with a mortgage at the then current uh, mortgage rates, because that's gonna be the key. Thank you, Mr. Andrew. And I just, for all of you, I just hope we, we have more discussion, Mr. Chairman, about indoor air quality, because we think we know that's what we, that's an area that we need to pay a lot more attention to. Thank you, and I yield back my time. Remind members that the vote has started, uh, and it's the intention of the chair to recognize two more members, Mr. Tonko and Mr. Griffin, and if either one of them want to yield some of their time, then I certainly will be willing to grant that. But the chair now recognizes Mr. Tonko for question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our witnesses. Uh, earlier this week, the Environment Subcommittee held a hearing on industrial emissions. I would like to try to explore how these sectors are interconnected, which demonstrates that comprehensive action is necessary to decarbonize our economy. In many cases, industrial products are difficult to decarbonize, and this includes building and construction materials like cement and steel. Unlike operational emissions, embodied carbon emissions in buildings are locked in place from day one. Uh, they cannot be reduced through retrofits or new energy efficient technologies. So, Mr. Elefante, do you have any thoughts on the challenges with embodied carbon? Oh, well, we don't have nearly enough time. <laughs> uh, th this is clearly, I would say, the challenge of 2019 to, to kind of get our arms around what is an emerging challenge. Uh, there's actually a lot of work. We have a, a summit coming up next week on this to get building product manufacturers, contractors, and architects and engineers together to essentially lay out the problem, which that, that's how early we are in this. But I would also just point to uh, actually some really exciting work that's being done uh, across many sectors, the CLTs were mentioned earlier, to really address this. And uh, I would just uh, uh, kind of add one thought to this, which is that we have to be thinking about embodied carbon as something looking forward. You know, what, what is the carbon that we're gonna spend from this time forward rather than the carbon that we spent looking backwards? Uh, and when you do that, it sort of changes the lens on embodied carbon and the importance of material product manufacturer and, and construction techniques as investments into energy savings then becomes the kind of formula. How much, how much carbon are you spending to create that efficiency? How long does it take you to capture that efficiency back? A 2050 time frame is probably long enough for us to be talking about a formula that works. Thank you, and how can uh, we encourage lower carbon materials or greater material efficiency for new construction? Uh, there's a lot of ways, but I'll point to the one that I think is actually most important, and that is the analogy of the federal government uh, and it as a procurer of green building services and green building products. Uh, I think that the marketplace transformation that we witnessed uh, was actually begun in the 90s by the federal government adopting new standards, and I would just uh, underscore the Im importance of the, the federal purse as a procurer to help transform the marketplace. Thank you, and Ms. Beardsley, what do you think about uh, this whole phenomenon, phenomenon? And does LAED the lead incentivize these types of uh, cleaner materials and greater material efficiency? Yeah, thank you. This is a great topic and um, one that's getting a lot more attention. We've been working on it and many of our members for quite a few years and LEED does incentivize by looking at the there's credits and points available if you reduce the whole impact of the building, and that includes accounting for key materials. Um, and we now have uh, the first LEED certified steel plant, Big River Steel in Arkansas, for example, so that type of facility can look at its own operations and employ energy efficiency to reduce the embodied carbon in its products. I think there's a few things you can do. Um, you can first give industry the tools to um, use technology to do energy efficiency in the manufacturing plants. Um, second, R&D to develop new technologies, and that's kind of where the CLT came out of, and there's some really cool work at MIT right now on cement. 
Um, and then third, encouraging building design and construction teams to evaluate embodied carbon as they're making choices on materials. And the uh, federal government as a procurement body, the Buy Clean California Act, there's a number of examples where this is starting to take place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we know the impact of uh, buildings on overall emissions, but I would like to focus specifically on direct emissions. On-site fossil fuel combustion in commercial and residential buildings accounts for some 12 percent of our nation's greenhouse gas emissions. Mr. Nato, what opportunities and challenges do you see for electrification through products like heat pumps? Okay. Yes, heat pumps are dramatically improving. There's a whole new set of cold climate heat pumps that can work better in places like your district. Still, most of the available systems are ductless systems, but most homes have ducts. I think we need more work on ducted cold climate heat pumps to better adapt to existing homes. And I think the Department of Energy and EPRI are doing a little bit, uh, but much more uh, can and should be done to help uh, refine these uh, systems for uh, existing homes and the ducts they have. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Mr. Chair, now, 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 Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The ranking member earlier uh, yielded to me so that I could uh, talk about bird safe buildings and how we can do that fairly efficiently while we're making the buildings uh, energy efficient. So I will return the favor from my friend uh, from Michigan to another friend from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg, and I yield uh, to Mr. Wahlberg. I thank the gentleman and uh, appreciate the fact that uh, we have uh, a gentleman from Michigan here today who has extensive experience in what we're talking about, including a uh, some uh, demonstration, a demonstration home in my district worked with the intermediate school district, uh, not far from my house. That, that shows what can be done, but it has a reality about it uh, of what it costs. Uh, I represent um, uh, many areas in my uh, seventh district that are extremely rural, uh, and uh, many of the net zero technologies being mentioned here today aren't exactly cheap or accessible in Adrian, Michigan, and the surrounding areas. Uh, while I'm for efficiency, and uh, 19 years ago, um, my wife and I uh, renovated and restored completely uh, our 1837 vintage farmhouse. And at that time, what we did in uh, air conditioning, heating, uh, electrical systems, water systems, um, uh, everything, everything about that place was up, up to date. That's 19 years ago. And so since then, we've been attempting uh, little by little to continue updating to standards, but it takes time and it's expensive. So in your testimony, Mr. McIntyre, uh, you mentioned that, ne that net zero building is extremely difficult, costly, and impractical in many parts of the nation. Could you elaborate further? Uh, do you have examples why this would be the case in, in states like Michigan? Well, a, a lot of what drives that is the complexity of understanding when you build a net zero home uh, or you build a high performance home. I wouldn't even necessarily go to net zero. You build a high performance home. You, you need to look at the system of the home. You need to look at build the house as a system and understand the whole system. So the complexity comes in understanding that. The unintended consequences are when we don't understand that. We put the wrong parts together. We put them together the wrong way in the wrong climate, uh, and we end up with issues. We end up with air quality issues. We end up with moisture issues, so on and so forth. So that's a, a lot of what drives the, the difficulties is getting the consumer and the industry further along. They've come a long ways in the last 10, 15 years, further along in understanding that education level, understanding the complexity of the modern home and a high-performance home, so we don't end up with those, those serious unintended consequences. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Zimmerman, um, how does uh, customer demand influence the type of products you sell? Well, certainly customers are demanding more and more resilient and sustainable products. Uh, they may specify that they want to, to be able to prove that they have a reduced carbon footprint, and we certainly take that into our product design. Do they know, know the specifics that they're looking for, or are they expecting somebody to tell them? I think it goes both ways, but certainly we are market driven. The market instructs us in terms of what's important to them for that particular building sector. Uh, hence, uh, it would be um, incumbent upon us in government to, to make sure that we understand the market as well, uh, understand what's out there. I think there's a lot of technologies out there we can take advantage of, and the more we can understand what the needs are of the marketplace, the better we can service the marketplace. Okay. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the.
Courtesy, and I yield back. I, I will, uh, I'll take that last minute 20 real quick. Um, and, and just Dr. Zimmerman, if you could, does your company have a, a uh, film that they can add to a, a window or energy efficiency film that also is something that the birds can see? I'm not aware of anything at this point in time, but I'd prefer to get back to you on that. Uh, if, if you would, because I know the products are out there, uh, whether your company makes it or not, they, there are products out there. And if you, if you put it in when you're building the building, the cost is non-existent or minimal. If you wait till later, of course, obviously, it, it's much more expensive. But with the report coming out yesterday that we've lost uh, up to 30% of the birds uh, in North America, uh, since 1970. It's something that's high time we take a look at, particularly when the cost is low. I do know we just recently uh, discussed with Terraforma One a unique uh, concrete structure for mon monarch butterflies. For okay. Improving habitat for them. Yeah. Uh, perhaps we have something for birds as well. I'm not aware. And there's, and there's lots of other things you can do, and some of the material I submitted for the record has, you know, and some people wouldn't like this, but some do, a decorative mesh that you put around the building that lets the light come in but it makes a, a barrier that birds can see so they don't think they're flying into open space and crash into a, a building and die. And when the Guardian uh, publication earlier this year put out an estimate as high as a billion dollars, so it's, it's, I mean, a billion birds, it's a concern. Well, I'm happy to get look into that, thank I you. I yield back. Uh, the chair now recognizes Ms. Custer for uh, one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We, our votes have been called. Uh, but I want to commend the chair and all of you for being here. This is a win-win-win scenario and a very bipartisan hearing, and we can save the planet, save money, create jobs, and it turns out save the birds. I'm going to just dive right in. I'm a proud co-sponsor of my friend uh, Congressman Welch's uh, bill on improving energy efficiency, and my question is about the most cost-effective energy efficiency technologies that can be deployed, and in particular, I'm from a rural district, is there anything uh, in particular about these technologies for rural communities and homeowners that you would recommend? And anybody can take it, and our time is short. I'll start. Uh, Smart building controls can often be some of the most cost-effective uh, opportunities, particularly in commercial buildings, but also there's some in a residential. Some of the other residential stuff vary very much from uh, home to home or building uh, to building. That also brings into rural areas uh, the need sometimes for rural broadband, which is a whole big issue, but uh, uh, something that ultimately we need to address if we're gonna get all the benefits to all of the U.S. and not just the urban areas. And definitely, we're working on that as well. And by, you, by that, you mean smart technologies so that homeowners and business owners can control their energy efficiency and their use? Uh, often it means having sensors that help identify when something is out of kilter and either automatically adjusting or at least letting people know so they don't just go for years and years unaware of the problem. Any other just add, just quick adding ideas? to Mr. Nadell? Um, first of all, weatherization. So definitely getting better um, insulation in these buildings, and then secondly, uh, making sure that there's availability of high efficiency products and that the workforce is trained so that naturally, as um, HVAC breaks down and needs to be replaced, it's replaced with high efficiency. Great, options. very helpful. I should have mentioned cold in rural. So thank if you, I Mr. McIntyre. Sure. If I can just make a quick comment on that. The quick analogy in my perspective is address the envelope first, address the load of the building first, what the building needs, and then address the efficiencies of what goes into it. If we put high efficiency systems into a building that we don't address the building, I have a simple analogy for that that I tell customers regularly and I put in my presentations. That's wasting energy more efficiently. Yeah. Thank you. Having grown up in a very drafty colonial, I can relate. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time, and thank you, Mr. Chair. This is General Lady. Uh, Chair now requests unanimous consent to enter uh, into the record five documents, uh, uh, and without objection, so ordered. Uh, that concludes the witnesses questions, and I would like to thank all of our uh, witnesses uh, for their participation in today's hearing. I must remind members that pursuant to committee rules, they have 10 
business days to submit additional questions for the record to be answered by the witnesses who have appeared. I ask each witness to respond promptly to any such questions that you may receive. And at this time, uh, the subcommittee stands adjourned.